for uh, coming. Um, I looked at the sun and I thought that's a very good omen. The sun is shining on Israel because this morning when I was chairing a meeting on Iran, it was pouring <laughs> with rain. One of our speakers had left Boston on the six o'clock shuttle, arrived at National Airport at seven to find out that the airport was closed. They taxied for an hour over the airport. The plane was hit twice with lightning. They flew to uh, Philadelphia and sat on the plane for until he had to cancel coming to, wa to Washington. The, another of our speaker left New York at 6.30, arrived here at 11.30, sitting on the plane in New York for two and a half hours. So, and then now suddenly everybody is coming because the sun is shining. So we take this as a very good omen and welcome your own. We'll bring you every time we know it's <laughs> snowing and raining, we'll bring you here. It's a delight to have my friend and colleague, Yoram Perry, the director of the Joseph B. and Alma Gildenhorn Institute for Israel Studies, and Abraham S. and Jack K. Chair in Israel Studies at the University of Maryland. Um, Ambassador Gildenhorn is the chairman of the board of the Woodrow Wilson Center and the University of Maryland. And um, I must say that I was present at the inception of this center because Joe was looking for a director and we were talking on about this person and that person and that person and finally um, when Yoram accepted the offer, we all got very excited and we knew that he would turn that center into something extraordinary, but not as extraordinary as it has become. How many students do you have? We have almost 500 students taking 15 courses on Israel. So here the you are. The largest program in the United yeah. States. Yeah. And Yoram has authored a number of books and scholarly articles, including Generals in the Cabinet Room, How the Military Shapes Israeli Policy, Brothers at War, uh, Rabin's Assassination and the Cultural War in Israel, and Telepopulism, Media and Politics in Israel and Between Battles and Ballots, Israeli Military in Politics. Um, today he's going to talk about Israel's new government, new faces, and same policies. Um, I'm not so sure whether some of the newcomers in the Israeli government will agree with you. They think they are going to be instrumental in bringing changes, but you talk about new policies. Let's see what you have to have. Please join me in welcoming Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. It's always a pleasure to be here and to be with you and your wonderful programs. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot pursue the idea of the sun that you started with. It was much sunnier in the beginning of the week in Israel oh. when, when uh, State Secretary Kerry had a long conversation with, uh, with, with Netanyahu. He came out from this, do you hear me at the back? Yeah, this works and you uh, He came out after the, after the meeting saying that they were very constructive talks. Uh, yesterday, President Obama said that there is a window of opportunity. But I'm afraid that in the last 24 hours or 30 hours, there are more clouds than sun. We look out of the window. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and it seems that uh, both the Palestinians and the Israelis do not accept the basic principles that were laid down by Secretary Kerry. Uh, the Palestinians still demand that Israel should uh, seize any establish, establishing of any settlements, and they want Israel to let many of the prisoners 
the terrorists free before the negotiations, so they have some preconditions. And the Israeli authorities, at first informally, then more formally, also said that they cannot accept the carry plan. They cannot, they cannot accept the idea to discuss, to start the negotiations only with boundaries or borders and security. They want to deal with the, with the, with the substance, substantive questions, including the problem of Jerusalem, the, 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 the right of return of the Palestinians, and they demand, almost as a precondition, a clear definition of Israel, acceptance of the Palestinian position, that Israel is the, a Jewish state. So it seems that uh, the uh, probability for a good start today is less than it was four days ago. Had uh, the St Secretary of State had I had my talk a week ago, <laughs> and had he listened to me, he would have known that this is what will happen. <laughs> because I'm, I'm afraid that I'm not as optimistic uh, as some people are. And my, my intention today is to really to do what they do in the Washington Post on Sunday morning, to refute five myths. So the first myth uh, is the myth which you all know about. I don't think that I'll, I will say anything new to you about that. And that's the myth that, that many people, voters, pundits, journalists, observers, foreign journalists, had in Israel before the elections that Netanyahu's coalition will win. Uh, let's see what happened to that myth. I'll be very short because I guess that some of the information is, is known to you and I want to, to put more emphasis on the new myths that exist. The, uh, the uh, expectations before the elections were that the right-wing bloc in Israel that had 64 seats out of 120 will gain more power after the elections. Some, uh, some public opinion pollsters said that the, this bloc will get even 70 or 71 seats. Uh, no one thought that, it, it, that the, the, the right-wing bloc will have less seats than before the last elections. What they didn't do is looking into a very interesting pollster who asked quite an interesting question. He asked, from whom are you going to buy a second-hand car? Netanyahu got only 20%. And this is more or less what he got in the elections. Uh, most people looked into more sophisticated questions, and therefore they, they failed. So the expectations that the right wing, will, the right bloc will be stronger were, were, were wrong. Or if you use uh, political scientist terminology, the expectations that these in elections would be reinforcing elections were wrong. What they were are preserving. They kept the same structure of power in the Israeli political system. And uh, you have two major blocs, the right-wing bloc, which has seculars, Likud is the leading power there, and, and, and religious parties, two major parties, and you have the left-wing bloc, and there's more or less similarity between the two blocs. So the only few, two or three seats moved from one to the other, not, not much. By the way, if you look at the number of voters, uh, even the left-wing bloc had more votes than the right-wing bloc. The left-wing bloc had 1,890,000, and the right-wing bloc had 1,853,000. But because there were so many parties, there were three dozen parties, only one dozen were able to cross the threshold, many, lost, many votes were, were lost, and therefore the right-wing bloc had a, sm a slight majority. So, no much change. All right, everybody is talking about the centrist party, Yesh, at Yesh Atid, of, of the new, bright, handsome television anchorman, uh, Lapid, who, who was uh, the surprise of the elections. Not really. That was another, that, that was another myth. Uh, Israel had, for the last 30 years, a centrist party. Lapid himself, he's a son of uh, another journalist whose name was Lapid, Yossi Lapid, Yosef Lapid, and his party had 23 seats when he ran for the Knesset. Lapid got, today, got only 19. Before Tommy Lapid, that was his nickname, there was another centrist party led by a former general to become the most important archaeologist in Israel, Yadin, called Dash, and they had 16 seats. 
The interesting thing about these centrist parties is that they don't last for more than one or two terms of the, of, of, uh, in the Knesset. And the question really is what will happen to the new party. But you see that that centrist party, again, it's, it's, not, it's not new. So the basic, chain, the basic structure of the, of the Israeli Knesset has not changed. What did change, which is quite interesting, the balance of power within the right-wing bloc, within the Likud party, and the other small groups that encompasses this, 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 this bloc. Within the Likud, the more moderate wing, people that I'm sure you know the names, Benny Begin, the son of the former pres uh, Prime Minister Begin, Dan Meridor, and others, they were not re-elected in the primaries. And, on the, uh, and uh, the, what the opposite, the opposite have occurred, and some extremists within the Likud party, the most symbolic name is uh, Feiglin, uh, they, they won. So the Likud party as such moved to the right. Netanyahu today, you can put him on the, on the left wing of the Likud party. He wasn't there three months ago. Uh, so you, you see that. Another expression is the strength of the settlers. The Knesset today has 11 settlers. There were half of them only before the elections. And very symbolically, now, after 60 odd years uh, since the establishment of the state, there is no kibbutznik, a member of a kibbutz in the Knesset. The first Knesset in 1948 had 26 kibbutznikim, kibbutzniks. Not anymore. So if you see the kibbutz movement as Ref reflection of the old power system in Israel, uh, now even not one person is there. So you do see that change, a, a huge increase of number of religious people in the Knesset. 39, a third of the Knesset members are wearing Yarmulka. A third, it's, it's, a, it's a huge increase. So within, this, within the Likud or the right-wing bloc, there is a shift towards the more extremist, if I can use that word, position. What does it mean? i leave that uh, to, to a later stage. Just to summarize in a few words, the, the left is divided, too many parties on the left, they don't, they don't have a strong leadership, they, uh, they, they are divided on the major topic, uh, or two major topics of, of, of the day, both economic, social and economic, some of them are social democrats, others are neoliberals, supporting Netanyahu's position, they don't have a clear um, leader, and they're the very young leaders there, and they also do not agree on the security and, and diplomatic issues that are divided among themselves. So the, the, so the left is, is, is weak, and one of the major is, uh, problems, institutional problems of the left is that the left in Israel has also 10% of the members of the Knesset who are Arabs, usually three parties about from 10 to 13, 13 members. Today they have 11. And in Israel, the coalition with the, the Arab parties is perceived as non-legitimate, illegitimate. They are equal citizens of Israel. The members of Knesset are equal, members of, are equal to any, any Jewish member of Knesset. But for the Israeli Jews to establish a coalition with the Arab parties is considered illegitimate. And therefore, automatically, the left is losing 10 or 11 or 12 seats. So if the balance of power between left and right really hangs on two or three seats, and you lose 10 by not being able, willing to take them as partners, then you, 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 it's very difficult to get a majority. So this is, this is one point. The other point is, or uh, the other myth that I want to discuss is the myth of the... Uh, of the younger generation in Israel. What did happen in these elections, and the newspapers covered that, is that uh, the younger voters, the millennialists, if you want to call them like that, uh, they voted against the old party lines, the old party politics, the old, the, the, the old the ancient party culture, and against the parties themselves. And they were looking for a new politics, new parties, and new leaders. And indeed, they, th this is what they did. And they voted mainly for two major parties, for Yesh Atid of Lapid on the more liberal side, and for, uh, 
for uh, the, the, the Jewish house uh, of Bennett on, on, the right, on the right side. Now, why did they do so? To understand that, you have to go to the summer of 2011 and the protest movement in Israel. The protest movement in Israel started before Occupy Wall Street in the United States. It was an unexpected revolution, very interesting. It started because some people were fed up with the, pr the high price of the cottage cheese, which is the most popular white cheese in Israel. Then it moved into, into uh, issues of housing and, and, and uh, in high uh, income of uh, um, high, um, high prices for, for housing, for, for education. It was mainly social and economic issues, not the political ones. When I say political, it's just an abbreviation for the security, diplomatic relations, West Bank, Palestinians, negotiations, peace, terrorists, these, these huge topics that Israel has been discussed for so many years. They did not see that as the most crucial thing. Not because they don't think it's important, but because they don't trust neither parties. They don't see the difference between the two parties on the left and on the right, Likud and Labour, or Likud and Kadima. They don't believe there is a partner to negotiate with. Uh, they, their, their, their political socialization was after the breakdown of the negotiations in 2000. So they saw the breakdown of the negotiations, the uh, second intifada, suicidal attacks on their pubs and, and, and coffee places in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, or coffee places at the university, or buses to the university. They saw uh, suicidal attacks all over the country. They saw Israel withdrawing from Lebanon, expecting quiet on that region, and yet the Hezbollah attacking us. They saw Sharon uh, destroying settlements in, in Gaza and withdrawing from Gaza, expecting quiet, if not peace, that area, and, and the Hamas continued to attack us. So they lost confidence in the, in the, in the, pr the entire process. And indeed, if you look at the, at the, post, the posts on social media during the election period, at the election period, only 24% of them dealt with a political issue. More than 70% dealt with the social and economic issues. One of which, of course, is the, uh, the qu question of equity, namely the demand of the Israeli secular youth to see also the Israeli religious youth serving in the military and working instead of studying at the yeshivot, at the religious colleges, and getting subsidy from the state. So it was mainly the Arab, the, the anti-religious the anti sentiment and the issues, social and economic issues, and not the, the future of the territories, negotiations, peace, war, whatever. And they voted for the, 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 the parties that indeed discussed these topics and not other topics. Tsipi Livni, that was another surprise uh, for those who didn't look deeply into the process. Tsipi Livni spoke only about the political issue and, and, and got very little support. She really almost negligible uh, uh, power. So another myth that one has to refute was the story about the future of that younger generation. When they, ha when they started with their, uh, with their demonstrations uh, in the summer of 2011, and they were able to mobilize the largest demonstration ever in the history of Israel. Many people thought that nothing will come out of it. They saw a movement in civil society, but they said, yes, it reminds us of what happened in Germany with the Green Party. It took the, the, this, NGO, this, this uh, social movement in Germany 10 years to develop into a political movement. And most Israeli analysts said, this is the same, it, will, it will be the same in Israel. Maybe not 10 years, because the things in Israel are always accelerated. It will take five, six years. No one, says, no one expected this social movement to become so quickly a political movement. And indeed, it became. And if you look at the new Knesset, it's a fascinating phenomenon. 49 out of 120 Knesset members are new very young. It's the youngest Knesset ever. You have three members of Knesset who, are, who were former student leaders. 
you have very many uh, representatives in the Knesset who were leaders or are leaders of different NGOs, who, who, do, who are not professional politicians, who come from, the, from civil society. There are nine journalists. It's the first time in the, since the history, uh, the, the beginning of the, of the Knesset, the first Knesset, that you don't see new generals in higher positions, but journalists. People who are more involved in social movements and are more reflecting the younger generation. There are more women than ever. Not enough, according to my perception, only 27, but still more than ever. So you see, you see a real change, and you see a very, this really reflects the strength of Israeli society and the strength of Israeli democracy. While in most developed democracies there is the decline in the number of uh, participation in elections, in voters, particularly by young people, it went up in Israel. It was uh, in, 99, in 1999, 79% of the Israelis participated in the elections. Since then, it went down to 65. This time, it went up again to more than 67. And it, it will continue to go. So you see a very, very strong uh, democratic ethos and, and, and high level of participation. So, uh, so if you look at this younger generation, you can see the new leaders of this generation. Lapid is one of them, and Bennett is, is the other one, is the, is the second one. And one can analyze <coughs> here a very interesting phenomena, and that is that we are moving into the fourth generation of Israeli leaders. They are not yet prime ministers, but one of them will be a prime minister in the next election. The first generation was the generation of the founding fathers and mothers. Ben Gurion, Golda Meir, Moshe Sharet on the left, Begin and Shamir on the right. They were, they were uh, before I continue, I have to remind you of the very interesting term that was used by the um, sociologist Karl Mannheim of sociological generation. He argues that not every generation has a, is a sociological generation. But if you have a young group of people in the 20s and early 30s, and they are influenced by uh, dramatic events, they will shape their uh, Weltanschauung, or worldview, the way they look at, at the world. And they, it will be a very cohesive group, and they will lead into new stages in their societies. So we see now the fourth generational, sociological generation. The first were the founding fathers, they were influenced by the Zionist movement, by the Second World War, by the fight against the, 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 the British mandate. Uh, their, their activities culminated with the establishment of the state. The second generation is called the 48 generation, or the Sabra generation. These are people like Rabin, Perez, Sharon, who were too young to remember the history in the beginning of the century, and their major event was this, the, the, the War of Independence. They established, they, they were in, in, in most, of, most of them were in, in, in uniform uh, during the War of Independence, and they took over when the first generation uh, left the stage. The first generation kept very long. It took uh, Rabin, it had, Rabin had to wait until 1974 to become prime minister, but they, they were the second generation. The third generation's major event was the War of 67. These are Barak, Netanyahu, Olmert. For them, the issue is the future of the territories, occupation, not occupation, liberation, negotiations, terrorism. These are the topics. And therefore, they deal with these topics. It's, that's my generation. And suddenly, you see the new generation who, as I said, their political socialization was after 67, after, after many years, after, in the first 10 days, 10, 10 years of the 21st century. When I go with my son from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, I see the green line, the old line, the Israeli Jordanian line on the way to Jerusalem. He doesn't see it. He, he sees Israel as a one unit. So for that generation, there are many problems that should be dealt with, but the issue of the Palestinians, the, what I call the political, is only one of them. And because there is no trust that there is a partner 
Why should we waste our time? Let's waste our time improving our conditions on all the other social and economic issues. So this is what is really typical of that generation. Let me move to the third myth that, uh, that I, I want to refute, and that is that the new, the new generation, the, new, the two new parties and two, two new leaders, Bennett and Lapid, who forced Netanyahu to establish a coalition without the orthodox uh, parties, are stronger, and therefore Netanyahu is weaker. Everybody thought that, and that's, again, that's a mistake. That's a mistake. What happened is that, as I said earlier, the right-wing bloc uh, lose a little power, but Netanyahu outmaneuvered the young guys when he established his coalition. First of all, the coalition is built half and half, 31 seats of these two young uh, guys, the, the new parties, 31 seats of the, of the uh, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. The, the, the parties are half and half, 31 and 31. But Netanyahu was able to get more members of cabinet to the right-wing bloc than to the new parties. So in spite of the fact that the right-wing bloc has went down a little and Netanyahu's party lost a lot of seats, Within the cabinet, he is as strong as ever, if not more. Usually, it's about one, to one three members of Knesset gives you one seat in the cabinet. So, for the young parties, the new parties, they have one one representative for four members of Knesset. For the old parties, mainly the Likud, they have one representative for two parties, for two members. And if you look at the uh, at the faction within. Netanyahu's party that is kept very strongly by, by the former defense minister, um, Lieberman, almost every, two, every almost two seats in the Knesset gives him one seat in the, in, the, in, the, in the cabinet. So the cabinet does not reflect the real balance of power in the Knesset. It has more power to the, to the, to the right-wingers, if I can use these terms just for short. Yeah. Ed, I'm sorry, you, we don't accept interruption. After it finishes, you, have, you can ask your question. Please. Now, secondly. This is if, the pattern. I'm sorry. Now, secondly, if you look at the, uh, at the division of portfolios in the Knesset, uh, in the cabinet, it's even worse than that. Because the new parties, the new politicians, got all the portfolios which has to do with social and economic issues. The most outstanding one is Lapid, who got a Ministry of, of Finance. But all the positions that have to do with security and international relations were kept by the right-wingers. The Prime Minister, Netanyahu. The Defense Minister, Bogi Yalon. The, the Foreign Minister. Uh, we don't have yet a Foreign Minister because we're waiting for the, for the trial of, of Lieberman. But the Deputy Fra Foreign Minister is one of them. The, the Lieberman is the chair of the Knesset uh, f uh, in, um, um, Defense and International Affairs Committee. Uh, the Minister of Housing, one might think that he belongs to the, to the social and economic issues, not at all, because he can, he can give money for more settlements on the West Bank. So I put him on the right wing block, and indeed he's a very, he was one of the leaders of the settlement movement. So you see that the present policies that are conducted today on the, so on the poli foreign policy, security, etc., is kept by, by the right-wing faction of the coalition and not by the left-wing co coalition. So what you see is really, uh, in spite of the fact that the right-wing bloc went down a little, in the cabinet, it has more power than it has to, uh, they had in, in the past. And if you add to that what I said earlier, that within the Likud there's a shift to the right, naturally, you're not going to see a major change of policies from the present uh, government. You can support it or criticize it, that's a different question. But you have to understand the structure of the, of the, of the coalition. And as Kissinger said many years ago, Israel never had foreign policy. It always had domestic policy which reflected or created foreign policy. The other, uh, the other uh, myth that uh, 
continue to exist after the elections, and it's wrong, is the myth that the religious parties have lost power in the elections. We d you don't have the ultra-Orthodox um, uh, um, parties in the, in, the, in, the, in the coalition. That's true. But the religious bloc did not lose power. What happened is very interesting. The religious bloc in Israel has two wings. You have the ultra-Orthodox, what we call Haredim in Hebrew, trem tremblings before God, and the National Religious Party. The basic difference between these two schools are two. One is, do we, as the Zionist movement was a secular movement, traditional Jews thought that we should wait to the Messiah to bring us all to, to the Holy Land. And the secular Zionist movement was something terrible. And therefore, they were against the Zionists. So one point of the ultra-Orthodox were not to cooperate with the Zionists. Second, not to, co not to accept any modernity. And therefore, you see the, uh, the Haredim who walk on the streets of Jerusalem in the middle of the summer with, this, with, the, with the fair hats that used to be to belong to a Polish nobility and were adapted by the, by the Jews in, 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 in Poland. So this is the ultra-Orthodox. The national religious saying yes to these two points. A, we do cooperate with the secular Zionists and we do accept modernity. When Israel was established, there were more in the Knesset, there were more of the second school of thought. In the last 20 years, the balance of power bet between the two has changed. And the ultra-Orthodox became much stronger. They control the entire uh, uh, religious uh, institutions in Israel. The, the chief rabbis are theirs, etc. What happened today, because of the new face of Bennett and his new politics, that his party, the religious nationalist party, gained exactly like the ultra-Orthodox. So the religious groups in Israel are now, or the religious bloc in Israel, are now divided half and half, 11 seats to each one of the two. And Bennett forced Netanyahu not to bring the ultra-Orthodox into the coalition, which is positive from the point of view of the secular Israelis, because in the last 15 years or so, the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredim, began to be more involved in influencing the public sphere of Israel. They were not only happy with looking at the, in, into their own uh, interests, but they wanted to, to have an impact on the public sphere. That's the reason why there are tens of thousands of yeshiva bochers who don't go to, to the military, and other problems uh, it, that you hear in Jerusalem all the time, in other places. So the power of the ultra-Orthodox has been curtailed. But it doesn't mean that in the Knesset or in the cabinet, there's no power to, to religious groups. Now you have the, the Bennett party. And Bennett party has a, very has a very clear position, both on religious issues and on political issues. He is interested on, in the future of the West Bank. For example, his position was that Israel should annex, after the elections, 60% of the territories. So, so to argue in general terms that the power of religious parties has declined, again, is a misperception. Uh, so you see that we, you have to, 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 to analyze what is going on, and particularly to analyze what's going to happen in the negotiations, and this is, what, this is the topics that really people here are interested in more than anything else. If you want to understand what will be the position of the Israeli cabinet in the near future, and we didn't discuss the Palestinian issues, that's a different lecture altogether. Different lecture, that's we'll a, invite that, you back. Or, or, uh, people who are more <laughs> expertise, uh, have a better expertise than I am, you see that the, the, the relations between the parties and, and, and the forces and the tendencies uh, within Israel are too important not to understand them uh, when you want to see what will happen in, 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 the, in the next year or two vis-a-vis -vis Israel and, and the Arab states, or particularly the Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Yoram. We'll open the floor now to your questions. Let me uh, run something by you. Could it be that Netanyahu got his way in forming the cabinet because he's more seasoned, more experienced, cunning, and Bennett and Lapid come in with no experience? Instead of Lampid, had there been someone with a lot of experience, would go for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Absol absolutely, you are absolutely right. I was expecting that to happen. 
And no wonder that he was able to outmaneuver them when he established the coalition. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman who had a question. Yeah, I mean, my question was fairly technical. Um, uh, you, you, okay, so my question you, was, yeah. I mean, do you consider, you're considering Libni part of the old party when you were counting? And I mean, she, she got two ministries and a junior ministry out of seven seats. That seems pretty good. Uh, I, I wouldn't consider her part of the right-wing block, and you've not discussed how, if she's supposed to be the point of contact for the uh, negotiations, how she's going to get along with the rest of the coalition. Yeah, well, th that's a good question, th th but it's a tragic, tragic question, the, the, the Tsipi Livni, because she belonged to the old school of thought. She belonged to the group of, li of the leaders of the Likud that moved from the right to the left on the political issues like Olmert, Dan Meridor, and others. Uh, but the pro her party was a centrist party with the fate of the centrist parties that al always collapse. So to have two seats means nothing. She got a position, and she's responsible for the negotiations with the Palestinians, but she doesn't have any political power, any political power. So she will not be able, besides presenting her own views, to do anything else. Even when she meets with Palestinians, she will always be accompanied by the prime minister's uh, um, um, expert who, who works on this issue, Molcho. She, 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 it's, it, it's really, you can count her as if she, she's not there. Yes, just wait for the mic. It's right behind you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but don't you agree, though, that uh, Netanyahu actually bungled his campaign that the right wing is really stronger than the results of the election, that by combining uh, two things that he did that uh, lost some tremendous votes, one he combined with Lieberman's party. There are people who would vote for, they could, but wouldn't vote for Lieberman. There are people that would vote for Lieberman's party and wouldn't vote for Likud, and he made it impossible for them to vote for the combined party. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is he went and he criticized Bennett for saying that uh, he wouldn't throw Jews out of their home and saying he wouldn't uh, uh, go along with anyone who would do anything like that. But it's a moral issue. And he's saying he wouldn't consider that a moral issue. Whichever side you, come, you, you, you support on that, it certainly is a moral issue as to whether you do everything the state wants you to do especially ethnically cleansing people. So he lost people by doing that. And so he ended up with as, as few votes as he could possibly get from the situation he was in before the election campaign. Right. You are absolutely right about Netanyahu's major mistake when he attacked Bennett. By attacking Bennett during the campaign, he really made Bennett more, more public figure. But you repeat the same mistake that most Israelis do, or most experts on Israeli, uh, Israeli politics do, when they think that Netanyahu, the first point that you raised, that they think that when Netanyahu joined his party together with Lieberman, both lost power. It is true that if you are divided in Israel, the parties get together more than if you unite. But it saved Netanyahu, because Netanyahu otherwise would, would have not with Lieberman, he got 31 seats, which is the exact number of seats that Bennett and Lapid have together. If Netanyahu would have run independently, he would have lost some seats. He wouldn't get 31. He would get less, less than that. And in that, and that he would, there, would, there could be an option that he would not be called by the president to establish a coalition. So it was an absolutely right thing to do. And he, 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 in his good judgment, he knew that he will pay for it by losing power to, to, to Lieberman within the joint party. 
but he, he is the leader of the largest party. He has 31 seats, and therefore he was, in, was called to create a coalition. Besides, that's a different story, he was very worried that, uh, that the, the Lieberman will join forces with Lapid and with another, the leader of the, of the Shas party, Derry. They are, they are, they are good friends, all, the, the, the whole three. And he thought that Liber they will, if, if he doesn't hold Lieberman with him, Lieberman might, might, might establish another block with the other two parties. That was the real reason why he decided to, make, uh, to join forces with, with Lieberman, and he did the right thing from his point of view. Uh, the gentleman and then... Uh, yeah. Joram, uh, as you know, I like to argue, so I'm going to challenge you a little bit about your uh, Very interpretation. Brief, please. Okay, me? the challenge should be very brief because we have a lot of questions. The, the point I'm trying to make, I do think this is a, uh, an important election. Uh, I have always a problem with the use of left, right, center, and all those terms. But when it comes to Israel, uh, when you talk with people, uh, they, they seem to identify the right or the center with the Likud. They go back to Jabotinsky, and you started your... Uh, analysis with Yadin uh, in 77. The fact of the matter is there was a very powerful political force in Israel, going back to the first Aliyah and Weizmann of middle class bourgeoisie, you know, mm -hmm. right wing or centrist parties, so going back to the general Zionists, the liberal party and so on. I do think that in some respect what we are seeing now in Israel with Lapid is a split now, a growing split in the right center between what you can call ethno-nationalist party, as represented by Bennett, for example, and the more Tel Aviv, middle-class oriented uh, uh, right center, as represented by Lapid, which I think in the long run is going to have an effect if there is going to be a serious debate over foreign policy issues. Well, it's, it's a good point, and it doesn't really contradict what I said. First of all, let, let, let us, for those who do not know in details, I'm sure most of you do, the terms in Israel. We, we use the word right and left, not in the European uh, uh, meaning. Uh, right and left do not, has nothing to do with social and economic issues. It has to do with the attitudes towards the Arabs. So you, the better, better words would be doves and hawks, if you want. Uh, but th these are the terms that we use in Israel. Uh, and indeed, the younger generation doesn't see much difference between the doves and the hawks. Now that there's no partner to negotiate with, so why should we, wh why sh should we bother, they say. Uh, concerning the, 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 the other element of yours, you are right. There is that bourgeoisie element, middle class Tel Avivians with the younger generation. And it has al also to do with... with uh, internationalism with the globalization, high tech, and indeed uh, Bennett comes from high tech as well. Uh, but th 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 this is what I call the center, and they, they, they voted for Dash in the past, and they voted for, for Shinui, Lapid's father in the past, and they vote for him now. The question is what will happen tomorrow, whether the party as such will remain. You, are, you definitely are right that there is that group of people who, are, who want Israel to be modern, part of the Western world, relaxed, uh, live, in, live, live in peace with itself, solve the problem of, 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 uh, of their collective identity, uh, and not, and, and uh, there's a very strong desire to do that. But the, at the same time, these people to think that today, uh, you, do not, you do not have to, you can reach it without dealing with the most existential question of Israel, which is the, the, few, the, the political question. I personally believe that you will not be able to achieve anything if you don't solve this problem. Wh whatever way you want to, ch to, to solve it, to annex half of the West Bank, to make peace, to recognize the, 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 the Hamas, or to, or to fight them, Th that's a different question. But you have to tackle that problem. Maybe I'm wrong because I belong to the third generation and not to the fourth generation. What does your son think? Well, fourth uh, generation. I'm a good father, so he follows me. <laughs> <laughs> not a good example. <laughs> your arm, I have a Or couple. is he a good son? <laughs> uh, has Lieberman been indicted? And if so, uh, how does that affect his party? And secondly, I'm curious, uh, the ultra-Orthodox, are they now serving in the military? Uh, how, how did that sort out? Mm -hmm. 
Well, Lieberman has not yet been indicted. He's waiting for the trial. Therefore, he cannot, he cannot be a member of the, Kne of the cabinet, but he can be a member of Knesset, and he is the member of Knesset, and he has the, the position of the chair of the Knesset Committee for International Affairs and Security. If he will be indicted, he will have to leave the Knesset. It remains to be seen. The position in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is kept for him. Therefore, Netan Netanyahu formally is the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And many foreign ambassadors in Israel are very unhappy with that because he doesn't have time to see them. So they cannot see a minister. They have only a deputy minister in the office. Uh, if he is indicted and he has to leave politics, what will happen to his party? That's a very good question because it is, it is a very authoritarian pa party. He controls everything. He decided who is going to be on the list. Look at number two, the former Israeli ambassador in Washington. Daniel Yalon was asked four years ago by Lieberman to be on the party, on the, on the party list. He became deputy, deputy minister, and bef a few months before the elections, Lieberman decided that he doesn't want him anymore. So he kicked him out of the, of the list, and he, 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 he could not run to the Knesset. This is why he changed swift positions, and he's, gone, he's now going to testify against Lieberman <laughs> in the trial. Before he was kicked out of the list, he didn't open his mouth. So, so what will happen within that party is a very open question. By the way, the younger generation of Israelis were, who were born into the families of Jews or who came from the former Soviet Union, many of them left that party, did not support that party, and moved either to Yesh Atid, to the more liberal party, or to Bayit Yod, to the more right-wing party. The ultra-Orthodox, the whole idea of yeshivot, that it, it's a fascinating topic and one needs a lot, lot of time to understand it. I'll, I'll say it in three sentences. After the establishment of the state in 1948, Ben-Gurion, the prime minister, wanted to commemorate the tradition of Jews in Central and Eastern Europe that studied in yeshivot. And he said, we should revive the yeshivot, the religious uh, colleges and will give exemption from military service to young people who want to study the yeshivot. It started with hundreds of people, then 1,700, not more than that. When Begin became prime minister, he opened the gate and there were tens of thousands. And today you have almost 60,000 people who study in yeshivot instead of serving in the military. And they, when they, they don't study modern professions, English, math, computers, so they cannot contribute to the workforce in Israel when they decide to, to leave the yeshiva. And so, so the secular Israelis are very, very angry at that. They, are, they don't like it, and they demand to change it. And there will be probably, there will have to be some reform. How fast, how quick remains to be seen. That was one of the major arguments, both of, Lieberman, of, of uh, Lapid and, and Bennett. Even though he's a religious guy, he was against it. They saw it as really an unfair policy, and it will change. But with the famous Israeli keyword of compromise, I hear now that the bill that is being proposed will, will be introduced within two to three years, not right away, not so soon. It will, but but, but the, the tide will, will change, that, that's for sure. How quick, how fast. How, how wide it will be, that remains to be seen. The new budget that uh, Lapid is now preparing is going to cut child allowances, which was a major, major source of income for the ultra-Orthodox families who had seven and eight or nine kids. By cutting the, chi the child allowances, it will force the, the, the people to go and work. What they, and in the past, they, can, they, they didn't have to do that. What you did see in, 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 the, in the last 10 years is more ultra-Orthodox or Haredi women going to work, which is a very positive phenomenon. But they had to bring money home because the, the, the husband could not bring money. With a reduction of child allowances, it, it sounds cruel, but I think it will have a positive impact on the decision of many ultra-Orthodox families to go and work. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, as my accent probably portrays, I'm from a land very, very far away. 
um, down from Australia and uh, we often like to execute our political leaders on a fairly regular basis for those of you who um, follow Australian politics. I'm just curious to know how um, secure um, Netanyahu is as leader of the Likud and Prime Minister by virtue of the fact his combined total with Lieberman went down from 42 to 31 and you know as you say he's now one of the most left-wing figures in, in the Likud. Um, how, do, what do you think is the probability that he may face a challenge from a more right-wing candidate or um, if he tries to push the peace process? I'm just curious to know your take. Will he take Lecou to the next election? And also, um, the coalition has agreed to raise the electoral threshold from 2% to 4%, which I... It's, it's working. Uh, it's, um, because uh, that brings it in line with sort of Sweden, Germany, New Zealand, other... Um, electoral systems that have a, a reasonably high threshold. I'm just curious that if that 4% threshold goes in over the long term, how do you think that will affect the makeup of the Knesset? Because from someone who comes from very far away, you get a lot of very different parties and a lot of very different um, actors um, that come in because it's such a low threshold at the moment at 2%. Let me start with the second question. Uh, what we, it, it will have, uh, if the, the threshold will be, will be raised, it will make a, a change in Israel party politics, because you won't see 36 parties running for the, for the, in the elections. You'll, you'll see much fewer than that. And there will be some amalgamation of parties. Take the religious, take the, 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 the Arabs, for example. There you have three parties. You will have either one or two parties, because you have the seculars and the religious, so maybe they will run independently. But, but you, you won't have three. Uh, within the, uh, with the other factions, you, the, you'll, you'll see some mergers. I wonder whether merits will run on its own. Maybe they will join the Labour Party. But, but you still, you, you will not get to the ideal dream that Ben Gurion had in the early 50s when he wanted to introduce the British parliamentary system. You have left and right, seculars and religious, Arabs and Jews in Israel. So, so you, so you, you need if you want really if you don't want to distort the whole the whole composition of Israeli society, you need eight or nine parties. You won't go beyond that. So it will be somewhere between the twelve that we have today and eight or nine that is reasonable. Netanyahu is secure because a not only pers personally because he's the is the most experienced prime minister and leads the largest party, but because he has other options. If people on the left will leave, or the center, let's say Shinui will leave, I don't think they will, but if they leave, he can bring into the coalition people from the right, the religious parties, one or two of them. As a matter of fact, I'm almost sure that within a year, you will see one of the two major religious parties joining the coalition, because it's a tradition in Israel for the religious parties to be in the coalition. If you are in the coalition, you can have impact on the allocation of national resources. If you are in the opposition, you get nothing. So there is a strong desire by, by the voters and by the leaders of the religious parties to join the coalition. And I won't be surprised if uh, in a year one of the two will join. So I think that he is secure. I think that, uh, that uh, I don't see uh, no one in Israel can forecast what will happen in four years' time. That's beyond reason. But for the near future, one, two years is definitely secure. It's last two questions together. Yes. And the gentleman next to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I, I've enjoyed very much your analysis of the Israeli political scene. And uh, I recall maybe 25 years or so ago, there, in the Likud, there were the princes and the paupers. Uh, the princes being Benny Begin and Olmert and other children of original leaders. Some are still around, but as you say, some are gone. Meridor, for example. Uh, who is now in the party? Are the paupers, which were mainly uh, uh, North African Sephardic Jews, uh, who now constitutes the, the Likud party? Mm -hmm. And let's take that one, too. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you said that uh, forecasting four years in the future is extremely difficult, but looking into the next, say, two years or so, how stable do you think the current um, governing coalition is, and what are the chances, would you say, that uh, early elections might happen? Okay. 
these th the, funny enough, it's not funny, it's odd enough, the Likud that was the party of the Mizrahiim, the, the Oriental Jews, North Africans Jews. And that, that was how, this was the, the, the deep thought of Begin, who came from Poland, and the entire leadership were Polish. He realized that this is the pool from which he can draw support. And in the 50s and the 60s, he became their leader. So much so that they thought that he was born in, in, in Casablanca. <laughs> they think, by the way, that Paris is, is, is also uh, North African. Uh, so so uh, that was the party of, of, of in 1977, the upheaval, the only elections that were critical in Israel, where you see, when you saw de-alignment and realignment for two two Ashkenazi voters who voted for the Kud, uh, no, I'll put it differently, for two people who voted for, for, uh, for North Africans who voted for, uh, for the Likud, only one voted for the Labour Party. And then in 1981, it was even more. 85% of the North Africans voted for Likud. But odd enough, oddly enough, they didn't keep that tradition. And today, if you look at the Likud party, they have very few representatives. The majority of the voters are from there, but the, the representatives in the Knesset, most of them are Ashkenazim. This is one of the reasons that many uh, uh, um, Mizrahi voters, North African voters, did not support the Likud party and moved to, to, to other parties. So uh, it's, it's like the Latino and, and the Republicans here. And the question will, is, what will be the policies and the strategy of the Likud leaders for the next elections, will they try to regain them, bring them back or not? It, it, it's a very interesting question. And it, now, the leaders are not, very few of them are North Africans. They're mainly Ashkenazim. The younger generation leaders of the Likud are bright, intelligent, uh, sophisticated, uh, educated young Israelis. Gidon Saar, who used to be the the Minister of Education, uh, was one of the major candidates to, to, candidate to, to come after Netanyahu. Bugi Alon, who came from the labor movement, but he, but he, wa he was in the military for the, uh, his entire life, and he was chief of staff, joined the Likud party four years ago, became <coughs> minister without portfolio, now he's a minister of defense, he's a very good candidate following Netanyahu. So you have the younger generation of Israeli leaders uh, within the Likud who are uh, very Western in their approach. And uh, as you said rightly, th their perception about nationalism is, is different than the ones uh, on, on the left. Concerning the, what, what was the other question? Uh, uh, the stability of the government going into yeah. this year's possibility of Earth. Right. I don't see any reason why it, it, why it won't be stable. I don't think that they will reach a position where Netanyahu will have to decide whether to negotiate with, seriously with the Palestinians or not, which will create a crisis. So I don't see crisis on that topic uh, issue. And I don't see really a crisis on the social and economic issues that are now discussed. Uh, we are going to go through a very serious period, a uh, difficult period. Uh, the former coalition, government uh, found in the last year that 40 billion shekels are missing in the coffins, <laughs> suddenly, before the elections. And yet Netanyahu won the elections in spite of that. So, th so now they are going to, the, 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 new, um, the new budget is going to put a ber ser serious burden on the people, but people are expecting it. So I don't think that will be, there will be a crisis. It won't be si easy, but I don't think it will be a crisis. And there's a wonderful future before us, namely the gas in the Mediterranean. Israel is going to be, in a short period of time, an export, a state that is going to export gas to the world, not only to, not only to use our entire energy needs by our own uh, natural gas, but also exporting gas. So the economic forecast of Israel in the next three, four years is unbelievable. Miracles do happen in the Middle East. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't happen on the political issues, more on the economic issues. Didn't I start <laughs> introducing you with saying the sun shines on Israel and there is lots of rain on the other side of uh, the neighbor, your neighborhood? But uh, before we finish, um, you referred to the cottages 
uprising. Just to show you how on top of issues we are, in the fall of 2011, we did a paper on that based on a presentation by Galia Golan, one of your colleagues, and she talked about the domestic impact on Israel of the spring, summer, and September. That was during those, that period where you had these demonstration, the cottage cheese mm -hmm. demonstration. So if you are interested in that, please go on our website and find it. And join me in thanking Yoram for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Joe is my witness. Joe is my witness. I never say excellent. So this is the first well time. Done. Really uh, wonderful. Yoram, do you want to write it? Give it to me. We'll put it on our no, website. No, no, no.